All right, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. It's after lunch. I expect a little bit more polite in the afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, all right, great. Thanks for joining us for this uh, panel discussion. We are looking at youth in technology and innovation. I have a great panel, a list of um, uh, panelists here with me, and we are going to get into some introductions shortly. I just want to read a few statistics that I have stumbled upon. Uh, we now have just about 7.2 billion people on the planet. Uh, just over 3 billion are active internet users. Nearly 2.1 billion uh, people have social media accounts, and I'm sure most, if not everyone in here, uh, you know, is a part of that 2.1 billion. 3.67 billion mobile users have access to the internet via smartphones and tablets. And some people have all three, smartphone, tablet, and laptop, and they're all connected right around the clock. And then close to 1.7 billion people have active social media accounts. Now that's phenomenal when we look at some of the things that you know we've been discussing throughout the life of this conference. Uh, interaction. Um, we look at also relevance of youth councils and using social media and technology in uh, connecting the voice of young people across the region. So to help me look at this topic, youth in technology this afternoon, we have to my immediate right, <coughs> Mr. Gordon Swaley, and you'll hear a little bit more about Gordon, but I'll just give you a quick sentence. Gordon is the CEO of the multiple award-winning Educocal Limited. He is a member of the prestigious Branson Center of Entrepreneurship in the Caribbean and a private sector organization, um, 50 Under 50 Award. Please make Gordon be welcome, guys. Um, to his right, we have Ms. Hannibal Patterson. And Hannibal is a social media strategist with almost 10 years of experience as an educator at various levels. She has done studies examining the relationship between Facebook and digital identity and Facebook and culture. Please make her be welcome. <laughs> and then we have uh, Kenya Mattis, who is the co-founder and CEO of Listen Caribbean. And we'll get a little bit more about what that is in a bit. Uh, that was recognized as a 2013 World Bank Top 50 Global Entrepreneur in Innovation and Technology. She's also a graduate of the University of the West Indies. So, again, please make a uh, <laughs> And gentlemen, felt as though they need to, you know, be on either end securing the ladies. So, rolling out the other end, we have Aldean Graham, and Aldean is the Founder and CEO of Smart Farms Innovation Limited. And um, please, guys, make him feel welcome. <laughs> we're off to a little bit of a late start, but we're going to jump straight into the discussion. And I'm going to just give each member of the panel a uh, quick five minutes just to you know, tell us a little bit about what it is that they do and um, expound a little bit on the topic youth in technology and innovation. Gordon, over to you. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Gordon Sweeney. Thank you for the introduction, Rui. The theme for today is technology, using technology um, and innovation. And I think that fits, I guess, my, my area um, perfectly. I am a youth uh, in, in, you know, in, in, I think, doing something innovative. I am the CEO of Any Focal. Limited. Edifocal is an online social learning service for GSAT and CSEC students with a spin. And that spin is a concept called gamification. For those who are not familiar with the term, gamification is the use of game-like elements in non-game contexts. At Edifocal, we use two core parts of gamification. One, a leaderboard, and two, an experience point system. So kids pay a subscription fee to access the Edifocal service, they start at level one in all the subjects that we offer, and to level up, they need to answer their questions correctly. Of course, the questions are centered around the syllabus of the GSAT exam and the CSAT exam. While they're leveling up, they have the opportunity to win prizes, whether it's a movie ticket, food voucher, phone credit, and that's just our way of saying, hey, you've done well, you deserve something for that. 
the other aspect of the youthful body is the needed work which I had mentioned earlier. And what happens is that kids are ranked on the youthful work based on their performance on the youthful body platform. So on display is their profile picture, their first name, their last name, and the amount of experience points that they've accumulated. When the idea for youthful came about, uh, I spoke to a mentor of mine and I said to him that you know, we would be displaying the grade accumulation publicly. In other words, the students on the, the other students on the platform would be able to see the performance of the, the, other, the other children, so they'd be able to see each other's scores. So he said to me, you know, that's, that's basically crazy. Why would, why would they want to see each other's scores? They, want it to, they, they would want it to be private. But I, think, I realized that we tend to look at things through our eyes and we project things on other people and we tend to make decisions based on that. And I think some of us get stuck in a particular mindset, um, especially the older we become, you know, we get more rooted in our beliefs. And it's really hard to you know, shift away from that, which is why you find that innovation or certain kinds of innovation will come from a certain group of people. So for example, millennials understand certain nuances um, more than say, you know, the, the, was with. So I said to him that no, you know, the world has changed, kids are more social and they want to compete with each other. I think it will work. And so said, so done. When we made the scores public, um, they can log on and they can look at each other's scores and they can really see how you know their how each other, you know, how they're performing. So what happens is that they they playfully are you know taunt each other, they you know they compete, they cheer each other on and it works. Now, each year we have something called our Eight Football Excellence Awards, where we give our top GSAT and our, and our top C6 student a thirty thousand dollars cash purse. So this is a cash purse that is sponsored by Eight Football, and we've been doing it for the last three years. March 2016, we'll be celebrating our fourth birthday, and of course we're having the next annual Eight Football Excellence Award. We'll be giving a cash purse. In fact, we may raise it um, at that point. Now. The event is interesting because it gives students the opportunity to meet each other. Uh, students who have developed friendships, relationships with each other, and you know they're getting to meet each other for the first time. And, you know, I mean, kids from all over Jamaica, whether you attend a primary school or, 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 or first school, you have the opportunity to meet face to face this other child that you've been talking to for almost five or six months or even longer. You know, so that has always been interesting to see how they they interact with each other at that point and. As an adult, hearing about gamification and thinking about it, you know, it may seem like it's a it's a trivial thing, but it's not. It really works, uh, and I'm excited about what we've done with it so far. Where we're going, I'll tell you a little bit deeper into what we've accomplished thus far, what our plans are in the future. Uh, you know, I'm going to be really excited to, to share that with you guys. So thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, hello, everybody. <laughs> My name is Hannah Patterson, um, and I'm a social media strategist. Uh, for those who are, weren't here this morning, how I this started was while I was away studying, I had I was forced to choose a different topic of research. I wanted to look at iPhones. However, um, teacher said no, the director said no, and so I decided to move into Facebook. Because as someone who was teaching high school students at the time, I noticed that this was the problem I was having. Students on their cell phones all the time in my class, and they were always on Facebook. Um, and I thought this would be an excellent opportunity to try and respond to a problem. Um, so I ended up doing research on Facebook and identity, how people carry themselves on Facebook, how they present themselves on Facebook, and also, um, on Facebook and culture in another master degree and looked at how Facebook, how, we, how Facebook affects our culture. Um, from that as well, I started to see the potential of this for business. Um, when I started the work, Facebook was, it was not profitable just yet. So this was in 2008, 2009. So Facebook had about 80 million French users and probably about 100 and maybe 20 million users worldwide. Last year, October 2014, I'm sorry. Last year, October 2014, Facebook hit their the one billion mark, and just now, recently, they've gone to 1.49 billion. So it's going 
pretty quickly. And this is something that we see is very pervasive in our lives. We are all connected to Facebook. I explained this morning that I found my stolen laptop through Facebook this week. So Facebook is something that's really, really important um, and relevant. Um, in another session, we also looked, a gentleman who's not here, brought up an issue, which is something that I'd also like to look at in terms of youth and technology, is how youth are using Facebook now in terms of social shaming, in terms of, he mentioned, pornography online. And so these are the things that we're searching and looking, looking into. Outside of that, in terms of my business as a social media strategist, I then work with companies now on how to use social media to build their brand and to build their, their company. Um, this morning I also spoke about the fact that the Caribbean has, a, we, are, we are really at the brink of something great. Social media and online, all these online platforms have leveled the playing fields. We are all having access to the same information. So now we have a chance to get in on the game and not only create things, or not only create negative content, you know, which is the girl skinning out or whatever. You don't need to do that. We can also create positive content. We can also use big data. And you know, as this gentleman here is doing, and our friends here. And so, yes, I'd love to hear your questions. love to exchange with you on this topic for us to share more on how we can move forward using social media, which is not going anywhere. Because Facebook, one quality of Facebook is that they are, they adapt. If you notice, Facebook adapts. So Facebook sees that video is what's important. Now Facebook has moved towards video. Facebook has seen that voice is important. They bought WhatsApp. They have put voice now in Messenger. They know that communication, community is the future. Community, data, this is the future, and they are moving full speed ahead. And so we can capitalize on this by producing services and products that capitalize on community and data and moving forward in this way. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hannibal. Good afternoon, everyone. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Awesome, we're getting there. One more time. Good afternoon, everyone. So you conference, guys. You have to live in half the park, right? Um, exactly. So my name is Kenya Mattis. And I don't know if I have to because I have to wait my circle. Um, my name is Kenya Mattis. I am the co-founder of Listen Me Caribbean Limited. And essentially what we do is actually very linked to what we've been discussing so far. Um, we've been talking about social media, we've been talking about the use of innovation and technology. And what we do is that we tell stories. We um, say to our clients, we say to the persons that we serve, reach your fans, reach your audience with content that speaks to them. And essentially, that's what we do with social media. We're telling stories. Every one of us every day, if we're using Snapchat to say, how we woke up this morning, what it is that we're doing today, Facebook, oh my gosh, here, yes, again. Or Twitter to say, this is what's happening right now during a TV show, we're sharing stories about our lives. And we as content developers, at least in the Caribbean, are looking at Caribbean content as a means of creating the web. There's so much rich content that many of us as Caribbean artists don't know about. Why don't we package it in a way that people will be interested in consuming using platforms that people are now using to receive content, typically the mobile devices, social media, and packaging it in such an exciting way that brands would actually want to come on board and be a part of the story and help to reach their audience with content that speaks to them. Um, we have found, and I'll just give you an anecdote, that um, how many of us in here are actually storytellers? I've seen a few in the room, I can't know Everybody here is actually a storyteller. If you're on social media and you're putting on, you're actually a storyteller. And therefore, um, what we're finding is that the stories that we're telling, using the innovation and the platforms that are now available, the stories that we're hearing are not necessarily those that are originating from us, from our tradition, from our culture. So I've found that there are many persons within the ages of um, within grades like four to six, seven to eleven that have actually lost touch with a lot of who we are. Give an example, I always remember, I'll never forget when I was telling a story um, to some kids. 
eight years of age in Monty Dublin. And it was a Duffy story. And we're talking about the fighting Duffy's and this little boy. And one guy puts up his hand to the boy, what's a Duffy? I say, a Duffy is a ghost. It's a ghost, you know, like that haunted. Oh, you mean like Casper? <laughs> so I said, okay, we have a real problem here. The problem is that there's a disconnect between our own culture and the same mysteries and the same kind of mythical creatures and all heritage versus what we're receiving with content. So what we've done is we've created, for instance, a digital comic called Legal Mondays. And that is a story that we're actually producing in partnership with the Charleston Maroons, which is telling Caribbean maroon stories for the very first time, which I've never yet been told, in platforms that would reach children. So not just opening up a book and they're gonna put it down. It's on their phones, it's on their laptops, it's where they are. So as content producers, we are in the process of putting together um, stories, collecting stories, um, actually producing stories as comics and as TV shows. You might have heard of this in the news, for instance. And it's a similar concept. What we do with this in the news is we're taking the stories that we're already telling, but remixing it in a different way and actually telling you the news with music. And we're finding that it's reaching so many children in very interesting ways, using the media and the technology and the platforms that they are accustomed. So these are types of things that we're finding in technology. Everybody has a voice, but the giving us a structured voice and putting kids to work, actually, we can actually tell some really, really powerful stories. So I'd love for us to discuss those issues as well for the rest of the afternoon. All right, great. Thanks so much, Nani. Um, Olivia? Well, guys, I'm a very short speaker. You know, new day technology and how smart farm plays its part. Now, what is smart farm overall, please? Smart Farm is a new application that we're trying to launch for farmers where we're able to connect agriculture and technology. We basically collect real-time data for farmers to allow them to, if for instance if farmers grow in like a specific crop, we are able to collect that data and analyze it on our web platform to basically allow farmers to get best practice in a nutshell. And also, we are looking at mitigating climate change and food security. That's the real objective of Smart Farm. Now, how did I get into all this? Um, a lot of persons call me a theoretical farmer because I've never planted a crop in my life. But um, Bill Gates and Steve Jobs, they took away the best inventions or, you know, Apple is the best device ever. Windows is, you know, something out there. And so I sat down at UE, you know, in class, here about all the great inventions, and I was like, where's my time to shine? And so we went on a Denby tour. You were giving away some free tickets, and we went there, and we saw a lot of farmers, and we interacted with them. But Denby is a place where you get all the good in agriculture, but behind the scene, a lot of farmers interacted with us and told us some of their pain. And so we started thinking about it, and some of my friends and I, we sat down, and we thought about creating a company. We kind of rushed into it. Um, this shirt proves it. Um, we call ourselves Genius Software Products and Electronics at the start, but we believe we're a genius, you know? Um, we revamped, you know, over the years, but um, the focus was still in agriculture. We kind of got a love for it. We, we kind of saw the passion because at the end of the day, Jamaica was the, the land of wood and water, so we were birthed through agriculture. And so we, we stepped we kept the company as focused in agriculture and stuff like that. Over the years, we are we're about operating in one year now, and we have achieved so much. Um, I know the bio was a bit sharp. I'm <laughs> really bad at sermon writing. So when I saw a bio to say 150 words, I was like, "Wow, that guy! Yeah, you know, I have a story. I have like years of stories. You know, I'm I'm not even young. I'm old. Like I have a 30 years experience. So I'm old, but I'm actually 22. Um, so." <laughs> I don't know how that fit in. I'm a math teacher and I still haven't known how to prove that. Um, yeah, so our real thing is really um, agriculture, providing information, and it's really, the world is really looking into this kind of technology, but I think as Caribbean, we're looking at a competitive market, and so I think farming and agriculture should take this technology as, you know, the next best thing, the next hot bread. And so we have been interacting with a lot of farmers, they're really excited for it and stuff like that, and we have basically turned a lot of heads saying that out, not only youth, but as a Caribbean country, we came up with such an innovative idea, you know, and stuff like that. And so really, a lot of persons might wonder, so smartphone, an app, lots of farmers may not be as, you know, readily 
wanting this thing. And we, we, we did the research, we realized it, and that was another learning lesson, you know, as going into the whole technology. We found that developing an app through it to farmers, they were like, hold up, nah, that ain't us. We, we don't even know about Facebook. So we revamped the idea. We were still looking at looking at youths going into agriculture. So we're actually creating apps, yes. But for farmers in the rural areas, we're looking at the whole aspect of SMS. And I think that's the innovative part of smartphone. We allow the whole communication to be done by SMS. So sensors in the field are communicating to our web platform via SMS, but all the data analysis is done on the, the, the World Wide Web. And also we communicate back to the farmers through SMS. So we're able to reach out to a lot of rural area farmers. We are able to just reach everybody. And in that sense, we allow for, hey, one minute. I was trying to do it in three. Yeah, Come on. on. I was trying to do it in three. <laughs> All right, so that's it in a nutshell and stuff like that. Um, yeah, I want to leave a thought with you guys. Um, I heard it from the Governor General himself once. Um, it says, there's nothing wrong with Jamaica that cannot be fixed by what is right with Jamaica. And I think that that can be gone into a wider where we can say there's nothing wrong with youths that cannot be fixed by youth. Because I see a lot of youths coming up with a lot of creative and innovative things, and I really admire you guys. You know, and I'm older, remember? <laughs> so I'm talking better to everybody else. All right. Um, 22 plus 30 years of experience. <laughs> yeah, there's a bit of gray here. I died my ear this morning. All right. All right. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, I'm always agree with a person on my panel that says, oh, I won't talk for that long. He was actually the person who said, oh, no, I won't talk for five minutes, and, you know, he um, had was, nine seconds left. was heading over there. <laughs> so, <laughs> we want to thank you guys. <laughs> we want to thank you guys, certainly, for those um, opening remarks. And certainly what's coming out of what it is that you're saying is maybe we should call this um, discussion on monetizing technology, technology through innovation, because I think that's what you guys have done. You guys have... Um, seeing the value of the different technology, uh, you know, the platforms that are out there, and try to find a way to monetize it, because I think a lot of us spend a lot of time on it just interacting and so on, but we need to look at see and see how can we make some money from it. Um, and that money can be to strengthen our uh, youth councils or different groupings that we have, but how it is that we monetize it. So we're going to jump quickly to our video uh, that Gordon has. And would love to show. It's four minutes long, but we're gonna only take two minutes. So we're gonna cue it so that we get the best two minutes. minutes. <laughs> <laughs> First and foremost, I'm passionate about Jamaica. I'm passionate about my country. Uh, and I think that one of the greatest ways to grow a nation is through education. So I chose education and I chose unconventional education. I chose education through technology and using technology um, to change the landscape of Jamaica. Uh, my name is Gordon Swaby. I am a 23-year-old entrepreneur. I am the founder uh, of an online social learning startup called Edifogal. It's a learning tool uh, with a spin and that spin is something called gamification. Gamification is essentially incorporating elements from video games into learning or into any other activity um, to make it more fun. Um, you know we chose to go uh, the route of education. I have a strong passion for education, I have a strong passion for technology and I think that merging the two has um, really pushed me to you know change the educational landscape in Jamaica. Alright guys, can I get your attention before you finish up? So what will happen is that you guys can choose from mathematics, social studies, science, or what's it called? Or language arts. Right? So you're, you're gonna choose a you're gonna choose a topic area, once you choose a topic area, you'll choose a teacher. Once you choose a teacher, you're going to answer questions. If your questions are correct, you'll earn experience points, you'll move from one level to the other. While you're leveling up, you can win movie tickets. You can win phone credit, real phone credit, real movie, real movie tickets, movie. Movie. any movie that you want. We have a system where we just send students along based on age, not based on how competent they are to move on. I want to 
Gordon called to say that he needed some teachers to do something and what, when I went and when I saw what it was about, it was this thing where it's not, it's not studying in the conventional way, it's just something that will pull them in. So I think that it's unheard of um, in this day and age for a student to be in a classroom on Edifocal um, doing tests and being excited about doing tests and asking for more questions and just wanting to compete with their, with their, with their counterparts. What we built, um, students actually liked it and, and that was gratifying for me. And just being in that classroom and, and seeing them so excited about Edifocal and wanting to do more questions, it's an amazing feeling. My favorite thing about Edifocal is answering the questions and getting 100%. I like that it was challenging and you got to have rivalries with your friend. Also in the leaderboard, you get to have the competition. My favorite thing about Edifocal is learning new things each day when I do each test. As, as a Jamaican, as a Caribbean national, uh, I want us to be more appreciative of our culture, of, um, of what we've accomplished. I want us to be in a, in a, much, more, in a much better position in terms of having more educated people, you know, giving people more access to opportunities. Um, I think that's the best thing that you can ever do for your nation. Having these capable students, having these students who are talented, um, it will impact our nation in, in many ways. Impact us in engineering, impact us in science, impact us in just how we communicate. You know, there, so there are many things that we'll be able to do as a result of having a nation of very educated people who can, you know, who are in a position to, to change the world. When I grow up, I would like to become a dentist. When I grow up, I would like to be a psychologist. When I grow up, I would like to be either a lawyer or an actor. see much use using technology as I would like it to be in a positive way. What about your peers? I mean, tell us a little bit about not just not okay. a 30 year old peers. Oh, I mean, young, oh yeah. my 22 year olds. Yeah. Um, well, you see, um, I'm from a background where I know a very hardcore programmers to persons who are just, you know, out here kind of thing. And I think overall it's an average way of persons using it in a positive way. I am still playing catch up with the whole technology, to be honest. When I heard about Snapchat, I was like, oh, I need to teach me that. But I see a lot of persons posting some really good things on Snapchat. Um, they, we have a lot of business in my incubator who are using Snapchat as a way to really bring their company to life and all that. So, average, we, we're really, we're, we know the power of social media and we're using it in a positive light in that sense. Yes. Um, I have the privilege of working with some extremely talented, creative people, and uh, they're all, I wouldn't say they could be my children, but sometimes I feel as if they are, because they're recent graduates, fresh out of Edna, fresh out of college, some of them have not even finished school because they haven't had an opportunity to, but they've been able to use YouTube to teach them to do almost everything that I've put in front of them. So, yes, they do use, um, you know, social media to communicate, but they, I've seen our team, and other teams as well who are developing products, use technology to collaborate among groups, so that gives them an excuse to say, I can't come into office today because I'm sinus, but mm -hmm. I'm on Slack, and I'll be submitting everything through, you know, these different um, team communication tools, as well as using YouTube to teach, to upgrade their skill level beyond where even traditional educational institutions have been able to take them. 
And so I think that a lot of times, sometimes we're, we're playing catch up with formal education because a lot of um, demands that are now being placed on us, they, they're o they outpace what we're able to deliver. You know, package into our syllabus, get approved by ministry, put it into our classroom, have a test on it, um, versus absolutely the train themselves in um, being able to use Japanese suite of products to put out, okay, well, this is what I know that can be done, but I believe there's a way for us to do this. And so problem solving through technology becomes an even more exciting process because the idea exchange process becomes more invigorating and more engaging. Yeah, I like that problem solving through technology. And I think um, most of the you know businesses and business ideas that I hear you guys um, supporting, it was a problem that you guys use technology to solve. The agriculture, the listen and use. My mom loves it, by the way. Oh yeah, Stephen. Yeah. So those again, uh, you know, it's a problem that you're trying to use the technology uh, to, to solve. Yeah. Let's get some more comments. Oh, the question. Uh, you, um, are young people engaged with technology as a tool for sustainable development? Do you okay. mean that um, I'm going to be with Alden on this one. I'm sitting mm -hmm. here, hearing about it is good, and I think that's a part of the issue. Many, uh, many young people, the average high school student, if you pull him out of school and you ask him this question, would he be able to say yes? This is where my concern is. Because as I said, I'm in social media, so I'm about spreading knowledge <laughs> and using tools to do this. And so for me, it's great to hear Odin is doing this, but I'm thinking I've been back for eight months and I've never heard this. It's great to hear, um, that's, that's Odin, sorry. Yes. It's great to hear, um, I know Kenya personally, so when I, I saw her product, I thought this is great. But people are doing things, but we need to hear more about this. I think the next question should be, how can more people know that, guess what, there are programmers in Jamaica who are doing things in agriculture. There are programmers who are doing, because things like Edit Focal exist elsewhere, but it's great to see that from the Caribbean, we could do it meeting Caribbean needs with the Caribbean syllabus. Um, so my answer would be, I'd say no until not no. I, I still think there is there's more there's more that we can do, and the average student, the average, when I think, I think of the average person, the average student on his iPhone is not really doing something with technology, um, other than, you know, talking. So I would love to see a point where kids, you know, are doing, they start to see these tools as, as someone said earlier, more than just a tool to consume, but then can create, without even starting a business saying how can we create something, how can they get the mentorship from folks like this yes. to start their little things. They may, not have a business, they may not have a business, but to start creating even on their scale. Right. So I would say, I don't think there's enough. I'd love to see more. Well, Gordon, maybe you could just take a shot at um, Hennifer's question, which is how do we get persons to know more about these innovations, these use of technologies, monetizing technology, um, and so on. How is it that you, so to answer your question, yes, I definitely think it's happening both receiving and giving. Sure. Um, if you take a look, if you take a look at the, the, the screen, for example, this is a real life of Ms. Lawn Lady Focal. Her name is Mar Martiza Webster. She joined Lady Focal on July 12, 2015. And since July 12, 2015, she has taken 870 pests on Lady Focal. One test is 20 questions, right? So that is 17,400 tests alone in language arts. <coughs> Total for language arts, science, social studies, and others, she's done 29,640 questions. She, she, she states she's answered 29,640 questions. Again, she joined in vocal on July 12th, as you can see. Now, there's absolutely no doubt, there's no doubt that this is happening. Um, I think that what has worked for us and will continue to work for us um, is key partnerships. Um, a little bit into launching any focal we partnered with the Jamaica Observer, and that was really a big push for us. Our partnership with the Observer involved some money, <laughs> which was pretty good to start. Um, publicity, and even to this day, we're in the Observer uh, on page three of the career and education section. So you can actually access any focal for free um, through the Jamaica Observer. 
Uh, and you know, really, it is partnerships. Um, we part we partnered with First Global Bank. Um, we've partnered with many other companies to really push um, any focus on the way it needs to be pushed. In fact, I'm, an, I'm actually negotiating a pretty large deal now, which, if it happens, will, I guess, change not only my life, but the life of thousands of other children. So, you know, it's, it's, I think at the end of the day, it's important for smaller companies to partner with larger companies to really push their agenda forward. I think that Jamaica, I mean, just being in this space, I'm 24, you can't, I'm kind of jealous now because usually I'm the youngest person on the planet. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, no, I, you know, I've been in this space for a while. Uh, I, 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 you know, before any focus, I, I had a, a website design and development company called Like Coming Touch, and before that, I was the largest gaming website in the Caribbean called Advanced Games, and I started this, I started doing all this when I was going to be So, looking at where we are now versus where we were, we in Jamaica five years ago, we've definitely come a far away. You know, there's a lot of opportunity in this space, there's a lot of opportunity for young people to get involved and to really make a difference. Um, one key partnership that I also didn't mention is our partnership with the Jamaican government. We are part of the Tablets in Schools program for both phase one and phase two. In fact, Edu Focal um, had the most engagement, had the most conversion um, in the program in terms of people being active and using, utilizing, utilizing the service. So, you know, there's definitely a lot of traction happening in this space. We have a far way to go, but at the end of the day, there's a beginning, but there's no end because the work part is continuous. So what I hear you saying in terms of uh, promoting these things is certainly partnerships uh, that's useful. Networking is also useful. And what you seem to do very well is just same, shameless self-promoting. <laughs> because he, uh, when he's answering his questions, it's always linking to something about EduFocal. So everybody knows about EduFocal. Um, so it's edging your memory. So that's a good strategy as well. We're going to um, open for some questions. Yeah, let's get a few good questions. And good afternoon. Very Thank you. And this will be the first time I ask a question at the conference. Um, I'm very excited uh, by the panel. Um, actually, each of you um, were into an area which I'm into or have been into. Um, my master's thesis is look, looks at ICTs, um, strengthening youth participation through ICTs. Um, the talk for eight years, and um, actually know into agriculture um, in terms of training farmers in Caribbean vocational qualifications. Um, what I'm looking to get from you, um, and I'm from Barbados, is a sense of how has it been in terms of support from the local community. When it's a local community, I'm speaking of government, I'm speaking of the private sector, I'm speaking about your um, target market, whether it be farmers, whether it be businesses and so on. And there's one question. Um, the other one would be, um, senior moment there. Um, right, all right, let's leave it up. <laughs> and then we come back. No, no problem. Yes, there's another question in the back. We'll just take a few more questions and come back to just um, make, make, make a note of it. So local support, um, local support for the initiatives that they're doing, whether the government, government from the community and so on. So um, I, I know you get more young people um, to, to become, uh, to create more um, content, because we're very okay. much consumers. Right. I hope you get more young to get involved in, as you said, more Correct. All right, no problem. Yes, Mr. Sandals Foundation. I was about to introduce myself. <laughs> <laughs> since, since you have a um, projects manager at the Sandals Foundation. Um, the presentation is, well, to say exciting, is not sufficient. Um, I'm personally gratified by the um, age of the panelists and the representation. Um, but most of us. <laughs> um, I want to just quickly ask, I, I could make a comment, but let me ask this um, quickly. I don't know if I'm a practitioner or a social entrepreneur or just somebody who is interested in trying to meet the needs of young people. Um, unfortunately, very often when we talk about young people, we put them all in this large, homogenous space that they don't all exist in. 
And in Jamaica in particular, if we have of the 80% of those who experience poverty living, living in rural communities and more than 50% of those are young people, what do you plan to do with what God has given to you to help them? They can't come to you. They'll never get here. And so I'm asking you as you think about and build out these grand ideas, which I, I, I trust that you will do and the next 50 years will look great, that you begin to fuse into the process of your development and the ideas that you have. How do you help those who can't come to you, who can't touch the Facebook, who still live in those black zones that Digicel and Lime can't get to? I'm starting a school of agriculture. There are 100 young people who are registered there. And if they see a keyboard, it's going to be two fingers and trying to find the letter A. How will you come to my school? When will you come to my school? We have three campuses, and that's St. Anne, and that's just one parish, and there are 14 parishes. It's not all in Kingston, or St. James, or Ocheris, or Mandeville. That's my question to you. And it's not really just a question, it's just to say to you guys that as you do that, a part of the development. When I saw the young people on the screen, I could almost tell you that they're from urban centers. I could tell you that most of these young people are from urban centers. Because where I come from, they don't speak proper English. So that's Excuse me, I don't know my name, my apologies. But uh, I'm, I grew up in Christian in Manchester. Uh, I would say a very rural area. In fact, I remember coming to Kingston when I was young and seeing Kingston and like, I was really amazed at what I saw. I attended a prep school, Sacred Heart Academy. Uh, went to Knox College in Clarendon. Wasn't doing anything at Knox. And my father transferred me to Home Technical High School. Now, what I experienced at Knox is, was completely different from what I experienced at Home. Um, for example, one big part of the, or one big aspect of that experience was class sizes. Um, the class size um, at 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 Pumo was about maybe 60 students per class, so they're huge classes. And for me, and I can speak personally about my experience there, I wasn't necessarily the brightest kid in the class, and I wasn't necessarily interested in, in learning. Right? Um, I was busy talking to the girls on my left or talking to the girls on my right, and she's learning, and I'm not learning. But I think that we're living in a really amazing time. Um, and I think that technology is really a great equalizer, not only for developing countries, but for developed countries. You know? So we're in an equal playing field. How, and you know, I gave that example because I want to really talk about how we can utilize or leverage technology to help that. So I'm the kid who didn't pay attention in class. Um, I was shy, didn't want to raise my hand and ask any questions. And the, at the end of the day, the teacher's extremely busy she doesn't have any time to talk to me afterwards, and I was interested in talking to her either. So, you know, how do you solve that problem? There's no quick solution. Uh, technology isn't the antidote. It is a, it's one of the many tools that we'll need to utilize um, to work on solving the problem. But I think that what technology helps, helps you with is scale, right? You can't necessarily, in a, in a class of 60 students and one, teachers, it's hard to scale. But think of a situation where you have all the kids online, um, smartphones, for example, are getting much cheaper. You can buy a smartphone for $30, $40. It's not necessarily the most ideal scenario. But things are changing and things are becoming a little bit more accessible to, to um, people on the, the lower scale of um, the socioeconomic level. So imagine all those kids in the class, all of them having access to this content. The teachers at the front of the class, he or she, is tracking what all six of those kids are doing in that class at that particular point in time. And within 10 or 20 minutes, you can pinpoint the problem areas for a particular child. Um, think of a test that a teacher is marking. She has to sit down and mark 60 tests, for example. You can use technology to solve that problem. And what is most important to us as human beings is not money but time. And if you can free up a teacher's time, it gives her a his, and I keep, saying, I keep on saying she, it's not female teacher. But if you give um, this teacher the opportunity to have more time, it means that she can pay um, each, she can give more um, attention to each, to each child in her classroom. And that is how you get development. It's not going to happen overnight, um, and it's not going to happen in five or 10 years, but it will happen. Um, we just have to commit to doing, to doing it, and that's exactly some of the things that I'm working on um, right now. Yeah. I actually really liked both questions. 
and I'll uh, tell you why. For the last question, um, access to technology is often seen as a barrier to not just accessing content, but accessing a way of life that seems out of reach. And uh, that was a problem that we saw very early on when we were talking about oh, digital comics and comic books and we're creating um, these fantastic interactive you know, pictures that move and talk to you and they look great. But when you put it in front of a child who does not really know that this is something that A, was produced in Jamaica because it just looks so fantastic and it looks like foreign. And B, there are people that actually do this for a living it opens your eyes to make you realize that, you know, we saw the kids earlier who I want to be a doctor or I want to be a lawyer, but even careers like being an animator, becoming an illustrator, becoming a storyteller are even now more accessible through technology. And how do we bring that or bridge that gap to students who may not have that access or that knowledge? What we've actually done is we're now partnering with the Rotary Foundation who have uh, um, worked with us to actually secure the fund with securing funding for creating a new project, which is, if we call it our foundation, Arm of Litany, um, Caribbean, um, which is called Greater Kids. It's a project that we're calling Greater Kids because we think it's great stories by great kids. And we're actually helping young children now to tell their own stories, but not just writing it in a book, but how to publish their stories digitally by themselves. So we have been doing pilot tests, and we'll actually be starting our launching formally in December, in the Christmas holidays. But we took it, we're gonna start at Trenchtown Reading Center, which is um, through partnership with the Trenchtown um, Foundation and the CDC in that community. We've been conducting focus groups, and we're looking at um, how can storytelling actually help to solve real social problems in the community. And I was blown away by what I heard. I've been driving through Trenchtown visiting the area, not realizing that the murals that you're seeing on the road are not just there because they look great and it's about a community beautification project. They're actually done by the CDC to help to reconnect the, the community with the greatness that lies within because they have forgotten who they are. A lot of them don't know the history of the place that they inhabit. But tourists will come by and stop there and pay money for people to take them there because that's where Peter Tosh, that's where Bob Marley, that's where Henry Lowe apparently had some of his roots. These are stories that we don't tell. And because of the 20 years of civil strife and unrest and unrest that they had in that community because of political um, factions, now you have a community that, although um, political warfare, if you will, has died down. Domestic violence has replaced um, political violence as the number one, or the leading cause of violence in the community. And you have young kids who are growing up, and they do have smartphones, by the way. They do have access to technology. However, they are not in touch with, I guess, the significance or the iconic greatness that they are around. So what we've decided to do is to work with the children to actually help to unlock those stories, tell them the stories of the people that grew up in the same streets that they're running up and down in right now. And in them having that connection with their past, then they can see, okay, maybe this is something I can become, and maybe these are new areas I can look at for who I am. So now you have people who are looking at <coughs> illustration, looking at storytelling, and looking at digital media and publishing as a means for furthering their own development. So these are some of the things that we're using to take to communities that may not have direct access to um, that type of um, education, if you will, as they say. Right. Okay, I just want to hear you quickly on the first question, local support that you mentioned about the foundation project that you were doing. Oh, I was trying to avoid that question. No, no, no. When I was coming, I was like, trying to be diplomatic. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to be diplomatic. Um, it's sad to know that, oh yes, Diplomatic as possible. I mean, who's listening? I won't trust me. I'm very blunt and I like, close All right, so when it comes to local support, the farmers are really interested. Um, at first, they were a bit skeptic, but with farmers, you have to build like, a relationship. You have to be there in their farms. You have to pick your crop. You have to taste it. Um, I experienced a catch bunny pepper burn my tongue off, you know, just to build a relationship with farmers. So we have, we have sold ourselves to farmers, but the issue at hand is selling ourselves to politics, and that's a, that's a thing in itself. Um, I'll give you a story, and that was just yesterday. I was at a meeting yesterday, and 
somebody told me, why not look for um, funding? And I was like, I'm sourcing, I'm trying to get funding. And they were like, can you go outside of Jamaica? And I was like, why? Why am I going to fix something locally and I should go overseas for funding and stuff like that? But to be honest, um, from the day I started to know, um, I've only gotten the runaround. They're always telling me who can help me. And when I go to who can help me, they're telling me who can help me. And that has been for the time I've started. So I just came up with a mindset is forget about the politics and the government and let's, let me do this for my people and for the betterment of my country. Yes. As for the second person, I'd love for you to invite me down to your foundation. Um, to be honest, if I said a bit about my bio, is that I love helping youths, and that's something that I'm a die hard for, and also rehabilitation. Um, so I'm always interested in helping youths go into agriculture because we, I believe not about just giving to community, but allowing them to sustain their own projects. And I think through agriculture, that's the best bet for us. And so I'm actually trying to partner up with Digicel Foundation to get a part of their project whenever they're implementing greenhouses across communities that smart farm be able to be there so we can actually give them that edge. Because surprisingly, um, in Trenchtown, I found that there were three greenhouses in Trenchtown. Could you believe that? I they're my competitors. I don't want to <laughs> It's not a competitive deal, man. All right. So, yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're not all competitors. So you need to get smart for it to be the competitors then. Yeah. All right. All right, let's get a few more questions. Yes, Maurice. Uh, Hello? Okay. Yeah, good afternoon. My name is Maurice Booth. Um, Actually, I think he had said first that he, he really likes the composition and the topic of the panel um, because this is something that I think we need to have a lot more discussions of because there are a lot of things that we see around us that are easy to use. Um, sometimes you get to realize how easy it is to, to make a step forward. A few, about a month ago, um, we at VCTT had decided we just wanted to do something for international youth. I'm so sorry, the Volunteer Center of Trinidad and Tobago decided that we wanted to do something for International Youth Day, and we decided let's try to have a discussion on youth, um, and we were trying to figure out how to get it done in a different way and across boundaries. Um, and we decided to use Google Hangouts on here. Um, it was at the end of it that I realized that someone asked me, so what point was it that you all decided to hold an online conference? <laughs> um, Terry was one of the presenters, and it went beyond what we thought it would have been. We, we thought it would have been a small discussion. Um, and the discussion was so big that it was kind of difficult to contain it, in addition to which um, it was kind of difficult on my end, while I'm, I'm facilitating to really comprehend what is happening. It, it went beyond us. Um, and I think it fits in what uh, Hanifa said about creating stories, because you create these stories without, can you hear? Mm -hmm. Right, it's another angle. Um, we're creating these stories without knowing that we're creating these stories. Uh, the one thing that I wanted to speak about, Gordon, um, there's something I started researching on flipped learning, and I'm sure you'd have, uh, you learn on the computer, and then you come to class. And I suspect you're using your flipped learning. What flipped learning is, is the student goes to their computer at home or wherever, and they do the research, and when they come to class, they just come to class to discuss it and to enjoy and interact. It makes class fun, which I had eight years of high school because I repeated, and I don't think I enjoyed anything except for the last year when we were ready to leave, but um, I think it can, I think what you are doing at least I can say openly in Trinidad and Tobago, our government has been investing for the last what, five years in purchasing um, laptops for secondary school students. I'm sure Where you've heard about it and you've been trying. Say again? Are you coming? <laughs> Excellent. So I just want to get an idea where your successes have been because when it's time to come and talk about it, I want to go and say, I need to mention it. Come on. Yeah. All right. We'll get Any other uh, questions? Okay. Great, so uh, Gordon, you could just wrap up by answering that question as you're up and then get some more comments from the 
other guys in the three minutes that we have. So I don't think I'd answer that question. But just one final point. Uh, I think that one thing that I guess one word that I really want everybody to focus on just leaving this uh, it was a part of the theme is the word sustainable. And a big part of sustainability for me, and I think that we have a word, um, we have a weird relationship with money in the Caribbean. But my view is that for things to be sustainable, money needs to be involved. Um, I consider myself a capitalist. I'm not ashamed <laughs> to call myself a capitalist. And I think that for things to be sustainable, you need, need to be earning. And Bono made an interesting point at the, the UN the other day, I think it was two days ago. He said, I'm late to realizing that it's you guys, it's the private sector, it's commerce, that's going to take the majority of people out of extreme poverty. And as an activist, I almost found that hard to say. So that's just one point that you should dwell on um, leaving this, this conference. Uh, I'd like to respond first to the gentleman at the back. Uh, sir? Yes. Um, I I'm also very interested. <laughs> I'm also very interested in coming um, to help. Um, I have a passion for youth, but I also have a passion for, this is going to come out so wrong, men, okay? <laughs> uh, in the sense that, <laughs> no, you know, in the sense that, <laughs> in the sense that, in the Caribbean, especially in Jamaica, I see many men on the corners, chilling, relaxing, smoking a spliff, and it really hurts my heart because the reality is when men, if you notice, when a man is gonna do something, he does it well. So if he's gonna be a cook, he's a, a serious cook. We sell weed, believe me, good weed sell. And when a guy, here they are, decides that, okay, I'm gonna, I've decided, okay, I'm not gonna let not, you know, our hating school cause me to not succeed. I'm sure these guys will tell you there was a point where they decided, I'm still gonna be a success. And I think many Jamaican men need that inspiration. Um, and so I, I'm interested in working in this area with companies. And men traditionally around the world, they do dominate in tech. So why not in Jamaica as well? Not, I'm not saying I don't like any men, I'm a woman. <laughs> but I am saying that we can, why not here? This is my question, why not here? It can be done. Not you know going to not going to a traditional high school does not have to stop you. You know, I was waiting to hear him say Campion or Woolmers, Woolmers. Um, but he didn't. It doesn't define you. And I realized in the Caribbean, many Caribbean youth. I spoke with several people today. We have that impression that if you didn't go to a Campion, if you didn't go to the best high school or you mean, it's not going to work out. I this is this is my closing statement. I would like. Us, I think the key to the whole technology issue is also a mindset. Is the thought that, okay, Oculus Rift is a virtual technology. I mentioned it this morning. Facebook bought them a year ago. And Facebook is planning now to bring gamification to another level. They're bringing games in virtual reality. I want Jamaicans to be able to, to say, okay, Facebook is doing this. How can I design games that in two years or in a year will be ready, that I can send something to Facebook, I can pitch to them? You know, why not? This is the, well, you have great content here. Why not? Why can't my product be, you know, I don't know, something great beyond Jamaica, but as Kenya says, coming from Jamaica, distinctly Jamaican. Um, so I want people to see, the, to grasp the capacity to think big, because then, when we give them the tools to to make these big thoughts, if you have the tools and you don't believe that you can do this, it is pointless. You won't know what a great what a great thing you have. So I think a part of it is going to be helping people, empower, empowering people to see I can become an animator. I may not have had the perfect situation but I can still do something great. The technology is here, the opportunity is here, it is possible. Yeah, I, I wanted to just add to that. And I believe the men in Jamaica really have great potential, but the thing is the resources is quite limited and stuff like that. You can free up WAF, that's my thing, free up WAF. There's a lot of things we'd like to import in Jamaica to help the youths to increase their productivity. And also, I believe that that's a true statement about that. Anything we do, we do it great. 
I remember seeing by my former principal, and he said, I know you, I know you. And I was like, you were the one that signed the suspension paper. Mm. <laughs> I did things to the best of my ability. You want to talk about rude, I was a terrorist. And then he was so amazed to see me get my Governor General Award in 2015. I was like, wow, how did you do that? You know, and I see where, and then again, I work in the prison, I see a lot of inmates and they are very creative. Did you see the cleaner? Did you see the headlines about it? They are having cell phones and services and all that Texas. Oh, I'm on that, I'm sorry. But yes, they are very creative. And I think what we need to do as a country is to, um, when I was in high school in Calabar, we had a lot of youths doing all the wrong things quote unquote, by the institution, by selling tweakies and all those things. And I was like, no, they're not doing something wrong. They are being entrepreneurs. So I would like for our policy makers to identify, not to call them wrong, but to really facilitate that. I believe if somebody is selling sweetie or biscuit on school compound, I would basically put them in a POD class and tell them, let's show you how to make a profit and all that, you know? So it's really to facilitate because um, maybe we learn different. We're not about the textbook life. To, to be honest, we are both practical. I never attended a class in UA. To be honest, I was a part of the YouTube University. I learned most of my stuff at U. Yeah, I'm a YouTube University student, graduate and all that, and stuff like that. So I would like to see, not just to say men to rise up, but also the country overall and the policy makers to facilitate that kind of rising. Because we are rising, trust me. If you're not gonna make us do it right, we're going to do it the best way around. Yeah, basically. The best way we can is what yeah. I already said. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Oh, sure. Just want to say, the YouTube, with, um, they're, they're researchers. They are researchers, just not doing it at uni. They are researchers. So, yes, we need to encourage this aspect as well. Sure. Everybody looks like we're ready to go, but I just want to say thank you so much for staying <laughs> for this panel. And I think that everything that we've spoken about um, really speaks to where we're coming from as an unanseasing type of culture where we would almost glorify people who found a way around the official way of doing things, the, the under um, dog, if you will, the person who can go around and cut corners and still you know find a way but i think that now we're telling our own stories and we're creating our own heroes and the heroes that we have today we have to really promote the stories of people who are doing it and doing it big that's what i love about being jamaican the fact that we're jamaican means that our audience although our producers or if you will our production side if you were a company is only 2.7 million people our good audience is global the world wants our products and because of that you have a small company like me who all i'm doing is trying to tell our stories but at the same time, CNN gets interested and wants to feature us and has us you know, on, their, on their page saying you have great content coming from small companies or small you know, spaces from companies from countries like Jamaica. <coughs> so I think the fact that we're Jamaican puts us at such an advantage where branding yep. is concerned. So we really just have to tap into being able to overcome the fear of working together because of what someone at the back mentioned was competition. Yes. And I think a lot of times if we see our market as not being local but global, that means that our competitors really are people we should be speaking to and trying to cooperate with to conquer the global market. Yeah, I like that, Kenya, and I agree, and I just expound a little bit and say Caribbean. Um, yes. The Caribbean has a lot to offer. Exactly. And just as you mentioned, what we need to get across over in Jamaica is that um, trust and so on. It's the same thing that we need to just expand with the Caribbean. We have a great product, we have great stories to tell um, from the car. And we want to thank you guys, certainly, for telling your stories with us this afternoon. Just a round of applause for everybody. <laughs> yeah, I love the um, interesting points, you know, were raised. We certainly found out who have a vested interest in men. Um, but as I said, from that, <coughs> we really uh, wanted to say thanks to you guys and also the point that you like, find your passion and also that mindset uh, for a young person. You kind of have to feed those mindsets and help them to understand how it is that we can monetize uh, the use of technology. And then Gordon did it so well, um, helping us to understand the need for partnership, the need for networking, and the need for promoting what it is that we are doing, however it is that you do it. Um, and he took over the panel and promoted um, his, uh, you know, his edgy focus. And a big up for that, um, Gordon, and just 
Thank you guys again for being a part. Thank you guys for sticking around. And I hope you enjoy it. Take care.